Listen with more panelists and members. Listen with more panelists and people. Hello? Uh, thank you for coming to this session, this panel session on funding. Um, my name's Sarah Brooks Wilson, and I'm co opted to the SPA Executive Committee in connection with employability things. And uh, we've been consulting with postgraduates and those in early career and other interested parties over the last um, three years, I would say. And um, people have suggested that themes such as funding and publications are really important to know more about and to share information more widely. Uh, so last year we had a publication session and uh, this session is actually accessible via the newly revamped SPA's website uh, along with other uh, previous activities that have taken place in connection with employability. Um, so if it's of interest please do have a look. Um, and over the next hour we're going to be talking about funding. So we have the time and energy of our panellists that has been contributed without hesitation. I'd like to introduce, uh, we have Chris Golden, Head of Poverty Team at the JRF. We have uh, Kat Smith, who's a reader in the Global Public Health Unit at the University of Edinburgh. Um, we have Ruth Patrick, who's a postgraduate researcher at the University of Leeds. And uh, we're hoping Laura Warren, Lorna Warren is going to be joining us very shortly, uh, Senior Lecturer in Social Policy at the University of Sheffield. And between them, they have considerable experience, uh, a wide range of funding experiences and uh, knowledge to share with us today. We are going to be disseminating today's discussion on YouTube because we would like to um, have it make it accessible to people that aren't actually here today. Um, so uh, if you don't wish to appear, then just be aware that, uh, yeah, it will be, it will be uh, disseminated via the ether at some later date. And if you know people that might want to uh, find out more about funding, let them know, and we will be sharing the link at some point in the future. And if you have any ideas about how you think the SPA could be working towards supporting employability, please let me know because I'd be interested to speak with you. And uh, last but not least, I'm going to be very brief, I should thank Nick Ellison, who is uh, the SPA chair and he's also today's chair, and he's promised to be very rigorous when it comes to timing, so we're looking forward to that, Nick, thank you. Good, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, on a, on a real final note, I, a real final note, I'd just like to say we welcome active participation. Please ask lots of questions of the panelists. Uh, thank you for coming, and uh, I think that's about it. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. Right. I don't really need it, but I suspect. It. So, are we going in order? Seven minutes each from the top. Yeah. Should we do that? Yeah. So, if we start with Chris. Okay. Is that okay, Chris? Good, yes. I've got this. Thanks. Well, I'm quite glad the other panellist hasn't turned up because that would mean there's more of us than there are, <laughs> there are of you in the audience. Anyway, so I'm going to talk about funding from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation perspective. Um, and talk about why we fund research, which is, uh, at JRF at least, uh, we try to find projects that are likely to have impact on policy and practice. Um, as you'll all know, this is a deceptively simple phrase, and it's very rare to be able to show real-world impact from <coughs> research. Um, so I've got just a few examples from JRF's uh, canon from on poverty over the last decade, which is how long I've worked at, at JRF. So one is an example of impact on policy, one's an example of impact on practice, and the third one is more at the level of ideas or debate. Uh, so firstly, policy impact. We did uh, a small 30,000 pound project uh, that was done by a partnership uh, between two academics, one at Bristol, one at Liverpool, John Moores University. Uh, as well as the head of the Association of British Credit Unions uh, and a non-academic consultant. So it was quite a mixed team. And the research question was what would uh, a not-for-profit doorstep lending or home credit service look like and most importantly what would it cost to the customer if you strip the profit out 
of that uh, model of finance. So the project was based on interviews with stakeholders, but also uh, some business modeling of what a, a, a not-for-profit home credit uh, operation would look like. And this found that an APR of 123% could be achieved. Uh, still extortionate by many standards, but quite a lot lower than, than, than is provided by uh, the Provi and others. And this research was published just before the, the credit crunch, so the, the timing was, was quite good from that perspective. And the crisis was a spur for us uh, and the research team uh, to persuade government to bring together a cross-departmental selection of ministers uh, to talk about what to do in response to the credit crunch for low-income people. So they were convinced uh, in the discussion that the effect of the crunch on people in poverty would be severe. And the response a few weeks later was an increase in the social fund budget of £250 million. Pounds. So not bad for a £30,000 investment. Pretty unusual. <laughs> um, however, you only have to look at what's happened to the social fund since uh, to see how uh, transient policy impact can be. Um, it's been more or less abolished, if you don't know. The second example uh, is the living wage, which is a growing and increasingly high-profile movement. And the rate of the living wage outside London is based uh, directly on the JRF minimum income standards research. The living wage would still exist, I think, it's pretty uh, certain to say, if, if we hadn't funded the, the MIS research. But the fact that uh, our research underpins the living wage gives it added credibility. And because the research is based on what the public think, it's rooted in social norms about uh, minimum standards. So it gives it an extra credibility uh, compared to, for instance, the, the London living wage. So thirdly uh, is the case of cultures of intergenerational worklessness. And I think many of you uh, might be aware of the project that Rob McDonald and Tracy Shildrick um, have done. In fact, they're presenting it uh, tomorrow or Wednesday at the conference. Um, they were seeking out uh, this mythical family where three generations have never worked. Uh, their search, like the Yeti, failed. Uh, but they instead proposed a different evidence-based explanation for long-term worklessness and the survival of a strong work ethic uh, against the odds in such families. So the messages from this study have been repeated by JRF, the team, and many members of the social policy community. And Twitter, blogs, and infographics have been a key route of engagement here. Um, but it was also important uh, that the, the willingness of the research team to get out on the road to present and discuss the research with, with uh, different groups, so civil servants and think tanks and not just other academics. So are there any general lessons to be learnt from these examples? Each one, I think, uh, answered a specific or a set of specific questions that are relevant for policy, although many of the impacts we've had were unexpected. So we didn't design MIS uh, to enable a, li a living wage figure. And we didn't think an increase in the social fund budget would be an outcome of the home credit study. So it's important to adapt to the context and take advantage of uh, unplanned opportunities. And I think professional and institution, institutional reputations also matter. That was important in the home credit study. So the academics involved had the credibility to get that group of ministers together. And of course, the quality and the rigor of, of the research itself is, is vital. And, but all three studies were really good pieces of research. So given the complexity and unpredictability of impact, how best to design a research study that gets funded? I think the biggest problem uh, <coughs> I've come across is overthinking the design and the context, the background uh, of the research proposal. There's nothing wrong with the basic tools of social research, qualitative methods, secondary data analysis, uh, international comparisons, policy analysis, literature reviews, evaluations. Where much more thought is needed is around the theory of change. Why and how is just describing a problem in society going to lead to two solutions? Policy and practice don't emerge from research naturally unless this is built into the design. So finally, what would I recommend for a successful pr proposal to JRF? <coughs> we outnumber you now. <laughs> so uh, just three things. First one, keep it simple in the methods as well as the language. Number two, give more thought to how and why your study is likely to lead to social and economic change. Write this down and show all of your assumptions. And be clear what level you want to achieve, achieve change at. Ideas, debate, policy, practice, or even attitudes and behavior. 
And thirdly, show that you grasp the political context. If your study relies on overthrowing neoliberal capitalism, please show your workings. Thank you. <laughs> So now it's working. Okay. Um, hi, so I'm Ruth Patrick, and um, as Sarah said, I'm a doctoral researcher at the University of Leeds. Um, I feel a bit of a fraud, actually, being on this panel, because I don't really feel like someone who's been funded very widely or very broadly. So I will be able to speak very briefly and probably for less than seven minutes on my <laughs> limited reflections and thoughts on funding and how to get funded. I think probably the easiest um, way to do that is just to share the limited experience I have of applying for funding and then a couple of reflections um, based on that. Um, firstly, I've um, applied to the SPA and been funded by the SPA just um, with one of their small grants um, for conferences. And I'd really recommend that as a kind of um, way of dipping your toe in to the kind of funding process. And it kind of um, hints to one of my main conclusions, which is you've kind of got to be in it to win it. So don't be scared to apply for funding. You know, if you have an idea or you have something that you think, you know, needs or deserves funding it is about just looking at what sort of opportunities are out there and then going for it and you know not feeling you have to have a certain status to do so the other um, way I've been funded is actually through working in partnership with another organization and again that links into one of my key kind of um, thoughts on funding is that as academics we don't only have to go for academic funding we can actually work with charities with NGOs with other groups and try and kind of work as partners to get funding. I did that with a small charity based in Leeds to create an animated film about the lived experiences of welfare reform. It's called Doll Animators, I'm all in it together. And through that process, we actually got lottery funding and that funding wouldn't actually be available to academics in their own right. So it was only through that partnership working that we were able to get funding. And um, so those are my, and then actually the other thing to say was that through that experience of being funded by the lottery, I was then able to kind of tap into additional funding. So I don't know what the other's experiences are, but quite often when you get some money, it's like more money begets more money. So because you've got a small pot of money, you can then attract other money. So I've um, had financial support from the Higher Education Innovation Fund um, at my university, the University of Leeds, and that's been really helpful in kind of building on the work that I've done and getting kind of adding kind of impact to it as well. So in terms of kind of my very limited reflections on that very limited experience, I think, um, as I already said, there is great scope in partnership working, so trying to work with other organizations. And particularly, um, Chris was talking quite a lot about impact and how we can try and build more impact into what we do. And often, this kind of inevitability in towards thinking about extending impact and thinking about the workings with policy and practice when you do work more closely with people who are working um, in the real world a little bit more than we sometimes are, I suppose. Um, the other thing which kind of ties to that is to think about looking beyond the usual suspects. So, um, I mean, the lottery wouldn't be an obvious kind of funding avenue, maybe, or a funding stream, but they do have sort of the Awards for All, which is a small funding stream that often you can get money from. And I think that um, you know, their, their funding approaches can be, they can be quite open and interested in you know, work that does build in um, some sort of academic aspect. The other thing I think, um, which is probably goes without saying, is just that it's a very targeted kind of process to applying for funding. And I think the, the thing that I can most equate it to is applying for a job in some regards, that you've got to think very carefully about, you know, what am I doing? Am I qualified to do it? And, you know, is there a match between what I'm trying to do and the funding I'm trying to seek? And I think sometimes, I don't know, when you apply for jobs or when you apply for your first job, there's a tendency to think I'm going to, the more job applications I do, the more likely I have of ha getting success. And obviously, the, 
the fact is it's about the quality of the job application. So it is about thinking in the same way with funding. It's about thinking who, you know, what, what am I trying to do and who might be interested in what I'm trying to do from a funding perspective and really thinking that through. And it is a bit kind of heartbreaking because you have to, as kind of Chris kind of alluded to, you have to think through your research design enough and thoroughly enough to um, you know, get that funding, and obviously that can then be really disappointing if you don't get the funding that you've kind of put all that investment. But you do have to you know, invest that time in it um, and really kind of think it through. Which links to the thing that it is time intensive. It does take a lot of time to get funding, but um, it's arguably obviously time well spent. And the final point, which is just to say that as an um, just a you know, postgraduate researcher, it is still possible to get funding. So I think just not to be put off and not to think, oh well, that funding stream's not for me because I haven't reached a certain stage in my career. That you know you can apply for things um, regardless. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, while we're doing this, we're just going to carry right on, so I'm going to go on to Kat. Thanks, Thanks Nick. <clears throat> so I was thinking about why, um, why I was asked to be on this panel, and I was thinking what you, kinda, you get asked to be on these panels because you've had some funding success. But if I think about it in a big context, I've also had a lot of funding failures. And, <laughs> and I think... Uh, I've been fortunate in that successes that I've had have been for some of the larger grants, which means that I've had quite a lot of time to do research. But I think I've probably learned as much, if not more, from the ones that haven't succeeded. So I'm going to draw on those as well. Um, so, so I'm going to start by saying a little bit about the mistakes that I made along the way, and then I'll um, have some top tips, and then I'll have some, uh, a few questions that Sarah asked us to think about and answers. So in terms of the mistakes that I made, um, I definitely misjudged and still continue to misjudge how long applications will take and have ended up working through the night and when clearly <laughs> you're going to make mistakes in that context. Um, so that's happened to me a few times. I've thought that I've read the application process thoroughly and it's quite, they're quite boring documents to read, aren't they? So I thought that I read it fairly thoroughly and then right at the end realised there was something that I was responsible for or needed to have in that I hadn't noticed. And a couple of times this was that I had to get um, external reviewers to, do the, to submit their review by the deadline. So I ended up in the embarrassing situation of having to ask someone within 24 hours <laughs> if they would review. So, I would, um, so with <laughs> that in mind, I would recommend yeah, read it several times and talk to people who've been in that scheme before. Although bearing in mind that the um, processes do tend to change a little bit each year. Uh, and that's what happened in this case. Um, I'd also say I, I've definitely spent time on grant applications that I wasn't really that interested in because I had in mind that you've, it's hard to get money and you've got to apply for a certain amount. Uh, other people kind of came to me with an idea um, and I thought, yes, I, I should be putting effort into applying for money, so I'll, I'll do that. And I have to say, none of the ones that I wasn't interested in got funded. And, they, and it is really quite a waste of time. It's not like an article that you can... Um, rehash and send somewhere else. Often you've tailored it specifically for a particular funder, so there's not much that you can do to recoup that time. So I suppose I would say whilst it, it is important not to um, uh, apply just for the odd one occasionally, if you, if you want to have success, I'd also say make sure that you really genuinely want to do the research that you're applying for. I remember when I was doing interviews in my PhD, I was interviewing academics as part of my PhD, and one really senior academic who was just about to retire described the process to me as like being on a hamster wheel and said, you know, you have to have four or five applications in for funding at any one time. Eventually, one of them gets funded, and you can no longer remember why you even wanted to do that piece of research in the first place. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I was taking a step back this year and thinking, I've put myself in that situation and, and it's probably not a good situation to be in. So in, in terms of successes I've had, uh, as I've said, um, they've been for the bigger grants, so I've been really lucky. Um, so, and they've mostly been ESRC grants that I've been successful in, um, also in an NIHR and a CRUK one and some Wellcome Trust small grants. So a, a mixed bag, but they're generally all funders that are interested in impact and um, public engagement, so I'm going to say a bit about that. So in terms of my top tips, um, so I'd remember that there's, uh, keep in mind that there are lots of different factors that play into a successful grant application. So there's your intellectual idea and the design, 
But then there's the fit with a funder. For a lot of these funders, there's external support. Um, so being able to demonstrate that there are actors beyond academia that are interested in this idea. There's your institution, institutional support. Um, so making sure that you are going to get strong letters of support from your institution. Uh, and there's the organization that, um, and the time that you give yourself to do it. And then there is a bit of luck. And I think that's just inevitable. And I, and I don't think we should deny that there is luck involved. Luck in terms of whether something happens to have happened <laughs> around the time that your funding application is getting reviewed that means people think, yeah, this is a really important issue. Or luck in terms of who it gets sent to review. But still, there are things you can do. So I would say get to know your funder really well. Um, what they're interested in and what they're not. And I've definitely made mistakes in that regard. I, I kind of um, had successes with the ESRC and assumed that other funders were interested in those kinds of things. And, and that definitely hasn't been the case. Um, yeah, read the small print and the detail of the applications as soon as possible. Talk to those who've previously been successful, but also if you can find someone who'll talk to you about it, as someone who's been unsuccessful in the scheme, about what kind of feedback they got and whether they have any um, reflections on that. If you are applying to a funder that's interested in impact and knowledge exchange, it's really important that you have really early conversations with the kinds of external actors that you might want to be engaging in. So at the moment, I'm doing a lot of placements with third sector organizations, and they are um, really quite annoyed, I think, at how much they get approached by researchers once they've already got their idea and their questions all sorted. Uh, and then they just want a third sector organization who will say, yeah, I'm interested in this. They want to be approached much earlier and have some kind of input into the design on the whole. Um, and be able to demonstrate how you are going to work with those external actors. So not, you can't, it's not enough, I think, these days to say that they're interested. You've got to say how you're going to be working with them. Are you going to be doing placements with them? Are you going to be doing some kind of co-produced research? In terms of the, what you say you're going to offer, be realistic about your timetable and your outputs. Um, and I think what's realistic is probably different for different disciplines and depending on your track record. So if you've got a track record of lots of publications a year, you can afford to say that that's what you're going to do. If you haven't got that track record, then I think you run into the risk of reviewers saying, well, they've promised lots, but how do we know they're going to deliver? Um, schedule enough time to get feedback and proofread. I know those are really obvious, but I haven't always <laughs> scheduled enough time in for that. Um, if you can, find really good reviews, literature reviews in your topic area, because that really drastically cuts down the amount of space you need to spend on references. Um, and most applications are space limited. So it's really good to be able to just point to an overall review, which says, look, I know what's going on in this area, but I haven't wasted loads of my text having to put lots of references in. Um, OK, cool. Um, if there isn't a review of the area that you're interested in, then it's a good idea to publish one, and that's something that you can do well in advance. And you can, uh, so it's the kind of thing you can do like a year ahead, try and get a, pub a publication um, that's basically making the case for your research and showing that you know what's going on in that field. Um, then there's the practical side of it. So get advice early on on the funding part from your research support office or something similar, um, and talk to other people about things that they wish that they'd included in the funding. I've made big mistakes here, like not including funding costs for transcription of interviews, <laughs> which is a serious error. Or <laughs> these days, I think you also need to think about open access costs, costs for publications. So then just a, a couple of things Sarah had asked us to think about. Um, I, won't, I won't do all of these. So a couple of the questions. So should I start setting up the research project prior to my application? Um, so I think, yes, definitely you should. But then you should be prepared to adapt it to external events or to the fact that the funder may change what they require that new year. But there are several things I think that it is worth doing well in advance. So one is this, can you publish a short article, a commentary piece, or a review of some kind that makes the case um, for this importance of this research and also demonstrates that you have some credibility in the area? Can you start having conversations with external actors that might um, then be actors that you can kind of bring in in terms of impact? Um, and can you start presenting the idea uh, <coughs> in seminars or conferences to academic audiences and getting feedback that way? Um, um, my final point, so what should I prepare before making a funding bid? Um, I would say, um, I think I've probably covered most of these uh, points. Yeah, no, I think I can stop there, Nick. Okay, I hope
hope they didn't film that bit. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to uh, talk. I've also come with prepared notes because I've been asked to write something about um, impact, but I'll try not to talk uh, to the notes too much. So, yeah, I understand. I understand. That's why I'm, I'm trying not to talk to the notes. So what I want to tell you uh, about, I, I've decided to concentrate on, on uh, the topic of impact. I think I'll probably uh, say things that have already been said, but that's no bad thing because uh, uh, rehearsing points uh, makes them hit home. Okay, so I uh, finished my PhD in 88, and I, that was pre-92 era, so I had a few years of just riding it as a researcher. <laughs> Um, I first started seeking funding probably around about 97. And um, a brief overview of my history of seeking funding goes from very small grants that were like pilot project grants that gave me a chance to try out ideas and have a taste of research. And then I built up um, using the sorts of ideas that I'd, I'd been um, looking at as a researcher, the sorts of ideas I've been testing in the pilot funding, and the sorts of opportunities that were around. So I went from Avril Osborne funding, tiny funding through the British Society of Gerontology, through um, some government funding, Better Government for Older People initiative that came through Sheffield City Council to do an evaluation, on to EC funding. So by this point, I was getting to be known and known in the area of uh, doing research um, on older people, and in particular on older women and through to ESRC grants. So I guess my first comment would be, if you have the luxury of being able to do it, start small and build up, um, because starting with a big grant can be incredibly demoralizing. As Kat pointed out, there are so many traps. And until you've had a chance to rehearse grant capture, you probably will fall into those gra uh, traps unless you've got somebody supporting you, holding your hand and supporting you. Um, the reason I wanted to talk about um, impact is because um, I think it's important to grant capture, but it's also important to thinking about um, carrying out the grant and also finishing the grant and moving on to the next grant, because increasingly these days you're being measured on your impact. Um, impact causes, um, and this is a Merton heated debate, um, I think some people are very cynical about impact, and I think you'll largely find it's people who are strong on theory that get cynical about impact. They kind of want to be left alone to write up their research and develop their ideas. And I think they've got the wrong idea about impact. I think, um, I think impact is, is important in that way, still looked at in that way, um, it's still a central part of the ref. But... Um, there's also a degree of cynicism about impact now because um, there's been lots of people who've been achieving impact for a long time and they've been knocking on the door and it's typically people who've been doing uh, the kind of research where they involve service users. It's particularly important in terms of social policy. Uh, and I think there's been some cynicism there and saying, you know, hey guys, we've been doing this for years, why the sudden interest? But I think we need to kind of pitch our attention somewhere between those two, two views and look at impact as something that's actually very important um, and um, worthy, worthwhile. It's a key element of funding, we can't ignore it. It's a key element of REF. And I think uh, murmurings are from the latest social policy panel that, that a lot's gonna rest on impact. So we have to look at this alongside <laughs> publications. It focuses our attention. It makes us think very carefully about what it is we want to achieve and whether or not we can achieve it. And it holds us accountable. We are, after all, spending public money. And I think it's important to, to think about all those elements. Some of the dangers of impact, it's unpredictable. Uh, we surely set out uh, doing our research not knowing quite what we'll find, and therefore we don't quite know what the impact of our research is going to be. Sometimes impact is serendipitous. Chances come along that we couldn't see in advance, that happen while we're doing our research, and we've got to keep our eyes open and grab them. Much of the impact is unfunded. It happens when we've finished our research, and so we can't always build that into our funding. And I think we need to hold our funding bodies accountable here. We need to ask those kinds of questions. If you want us to write an impact report a year after we've done our research, um, and that's a year without funding and a year without our researchers who know our research, uh, when we're further along the line as established researchers, we know our research, um, we don't know our research inside out like our researchers do. We need to think about how we're going to um, carry on achieving impact and write up the impact. And like I say, it's often um, uh, unsupported financially. So I think we, we need to think about those questions um, and, and um, 
start holding uh, uh, people to account and helping us to achieve impact. But um, uh, I think uh, 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 if we pay attention to it in the right way, um, it can reap rewards. So uh, what, what are my top tips again? I put top tips in my, uh, uh, my notes. Um, top tips, thinking about when we're writing a research proposal, what we want to achieve conceptually. I, I, the ESRC have, have highlighted these areas, and I think they're helpful. Um, what we want to see, uh, achieve conceptually, what are the theories and debates we're engaging with? What we want to achieve instrumentally in terms of policy, practice, provision, and what we can achieve in terms of capacity building skills um, on an individual level and in terms of the team too. Um, I think planning ahead is one of my top tips. Um, and um, one of the ways in which we can plan ahead is to uh, achieve a research narrative. And we can, uh, uh, the longer we're doing research, the better our narrative becomes. The more rehearsed we get clever about achieving that narrative. But it's never too early to achieve that narrative, to achieve a kind of um, a research identity, where you, what you've been doing, where you want to go with that research. Um, it helps us to present ideas. It helps us to build research teams. It helps us to respond to research calls. So that if we can think, if we can be ready with that narrative when a call comes, we know um, how we're the best place to respond to it. If you're working in a team, know your team, small or large, know your team, who they are, what networks they might link to, um, what, which participants they can help you to access, what, uh, what they need in, in terms of research, but also what they're able to contribute to research and what they want from um, research. Go out to the margins and then come into the center. Know how far you can go, but then come in and focus. Um, don't go too far. Don't put down the uh, unachievable. It will be looked at, and people will remember it. Um, um, network and engage. Um, uh, if you can, um, think, plan ahead, know who your stakeholders are. Um, I like to do participatory research, so I know who my service users are, the people I want to work with, people who are going to, um, at grassroots level, who are going to benefit from this research. Um, think about the public sector, business, industry, policy makers. Think about other researchers and other research networks, the SPA, uh, maybe the British Society of uh, um, uh, British Sociological Association, <coughs> um, BSG, uh, method centres. Think about university support. Who in your university is key to helping you? Uh, and that's not just the, the research people, but think about centres at the university. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and if you can, think about engaging with the media. Um, uh, the earlier you start engaging with the local media, the better placed you are to get them to know your ideas and, and they'll link out to um, uh, media uh, more widely. Sit, don't force it. Use methods that work. Um, in my last project, I used visual methods. It, the project was about women and aging and women feel aging at the side of the body, so the visual fit. But if you're using innovatory methods for the sake of it, it won't work. Um, don't try and achieve impact by being too clever. Use methods that fit. Um, be aware of and look out for opportunities as you're doing your research. Like you said, you can't always find them in advance, but a research commission might pop up. There might be some uh, cross-parliamentary body you can report to. Um, and keep a record. Because when you're writing up your search, when you want to show the world what you've done afterwards, you have to enter everything into the ROS system, the research output system. It's a bastard. And <laughs> it takes time and it's <laughs> it takes energy. And like I say, you've lost all your researchers to do that for you. So hold your university to account, ask them for support, and make sure you've got a record of everything you've achieved. And they're my top tips. Thank you.
associated with I've got one on <laughs> associated with universities or totally independent <laughs> Normally, with something solutions in the title. Yeah, yeah, something, something like that, yeah. Yeah, something like Evidence based solutions. Uh, I don't think we, Jera, tends to fund those kinds of organisations. We are funding market research companies a bit more than we used to, I think, because we're starting to do more attitudinal research. Um, <coughs> and they quite often put in quite compelling proposals to do that kind of work. Um, but I think where you have a dedicated unit within a university, for instance, the Centre for Research and Social Policy at Loughborough that has sort of waxed and waned a bit over the last 20 years, but um, has been a kind of solid performer. And I think a lot of those organisations that are able to focus on doing the research, like you say, uh, and don't have those other commitments, are able to give you better value for money sometimes. But they also, the repeat bidders tend repeat successful bidders tend to understand how, how to apply to, to your organisation. And I think there's a problem with getting feedback out to a wider community because we are constantly trying to get out to a wider audience of, of people that we fund and it's very slow to, to expand that pool. And I don't really know how, how to do that better because presumably everyone that knows, everyone that wants to do social policy research kind of knows that JRF exists and, and what kind of things we're interested in but we still get quite a restricted pool of applicants. Well, only an obvious one is, how about working in partnership with some of those organisations? <laughs> and I'll just, um, just to say, I've been asking policymakers, like civil servants, basically, and third sector organisations about those kinds of independent research organisations. And um, I think th there is still actually quite a lot of credibility attached to being an academic. So I do think it's a problem. It's a problem, definitely, I recognise. I do think there's a problem with full economic costing and how high that is mm -hmm. and where does it go. <laughs> no one seems to really know. But... Um, but at the same time, I think there still is something that you get above those other funders by being, a, being an academic and associated with an academic institution. been both Harry um, I, I <laughs> yeah okay so if you're PI the money comes through you but if you're a co-I um, if you're at split institutions it'll still come to your institution and if you take an active part in the research you can still own it I mean I think you have to make a decision about actually what it is you want to get out of the research uh, I mean it, it looked at on paper maybe it doesn't have the same kudos but I think um, it, if, if you can achieve your aims, it will lead you to be able to uh, engage with the research and produce outputs that are meaningful and you'll, you'll have recognition for them. I mean, often when you put in a bid, somebody knows more, they put in more effort. It's right that they're PI. Sometimes you're putting in an equal amount and, and it's, it comes down to tossing a coin uh, about who gets to be PI. I think uh, uh, um, you know, if, if your research is being judged by the right people, they'll understand that. Um, and you know, if you make the right case, that, that, that will be understood. So that's the best answer I can give. <laughs> I've also been both, I, I think, and I've been um, co-investigator on projects that have worked really well, um, and they've generally been where nobody's moved institutional jobs once the project's happening. They've, it's often been a bit more fraught when that happened. So I was co-I on a project where I did write a substantial amount of the grant, but it was very early in my career, 
And I didn't realise that if I then moved institution that none of that grant would come with me and that I wouldn't have any say in that, in that project, but I would still be expected to do some of the work. So, so there, were, there were issues like that. So I think, I, I suppose I would say, and in, in terms of your CV, I think you just need to be able to demonstrate that you, you've done both and you've had some PI experience at some point in your career and that can be for a small grant as well so I, I don't think necessarily um, you should put yourself under loads of pressure to be a PI if it's a project that you want to be involved in um, I think probably still a CV wise outputs count for more as long as you've shown that you've been research active and contribute to applying for grant funding. I'd say the biggest thing is, yeah, is that a project you want to be involved in and are these people that you want to work with? And <coughs> have you made, is it very clear who's going to be doing what, both in terms of applying for the grant and then if you get the grant and that kind of thing? something with the rest of the panel. <laughs> as, as the only funder, I just wanted to ask what, what would help to make the process easier? So is, is having an expression of interest phase actually helpful, where it's like a two-page outline of what you might want to do before the full fee? Or just, does that just make it harder? Or <coughs> how much, what, what's the sort of optimum notice period for a new project? Is it a year or three months? How, how does it best fit into your kind of cycle of work? Do both those make sense? <laughs> well, having recently um, responded to calls, both of which came out in July, I'd say never, never issue a call in July. It's the summer holidays. <laughs> um, but I, uh, I, it's an interesting one because I think some of the funding bodies issue um, calls with a short turnaround time, probably knowing who's out there ready with a response. And um, in that situation, often they're ready with a response because they help to inform those funding bodies. They help to set the agenda. So it's a bit like further on in your career, if you can get to that situation where you can work with, with um, some of the f main funding bodies, you can help set agendas. So you, you can't, it's a win-win. But I think there are some funding bodies, and JRF is probably one of the best, where you're not necessarily working with the people who you're going to give the funding to. So um, <coughs> expressions of interest there are good because it gives you a chance to um, uh, work with potential collaborators. Um, I think we have to uh, think in our research communities about being ready with um, ideas. So if a call comes out, we are ready to respond to it. So it's a bit about researchers being prepared. Um, but if you're going to ask for expressions of interest, yeah, I think eight weeks over the summer, you know, a couple of months over the summer just went, it's not going to hack it. <laughs> You're not going to make us happy, uh, people. But same with Christmas. Um, I don't know if there's an optimum time period. Eight weeks probably isn't enough to allow for networking and exchange of emails. You've also got to think about if we're, re if we're teaching active, how it fits with the academic calendar too so that there are key stress points if you're if you're holding a major admin model in terms of teaching you're not going to be able to respond exam board time things like that my view on the expressions of interest is it works really well when it's a short document so like two pages I think is the absolute maximum the welcome trust for one I'm applying for at the moment just asks simply for a short CV and an abstract and that is at that's enough, I think, for the funder to know if they're interested in, in that topic area or not. Where the, like the ESRC, the Future Research Leaders, the first time I applied for it, required what it said was an outline application, which was basically a short version of the full application. That was very time consuming. And then I felt like the, that, that two-stage process wasn't really very helpful at all. Yeah, and, and I suppose it's particularly difficult for them for the people that get through to the second stage. <laughs> I've had to do two applications, but then don't get funded. So what was your second question? Just yeah. about the timing. Oh, it's okay. kind of the notice and the timing within the calendar. Yeah. What's the best? I think at least three months, and um, I think the timing's really difficult. I think it varies by university and whether you teach master's students or not, like whether you have time over summer or not. 
that kind of thing. But I think one thing I'd say from an applica applicant's point of view was it would be nice, it's nice when the turnaround time you have for decision making kind of is similar to the time that you were given to develop the application. So I'm perfectly happy for the funders to take ages to decide if they gave me ages to develop. <laughs> but if they gave me a few weeks to develop the application and then they st sit on it for months, that feels a bit unfair. Yeah. Um, I haven't like got the experience that you guys have, obviously, but I think one thing in terms of um, from a funder perspective is to think about, you know, w in terms of widening the pool of future people you might fund, is to fund smaller pots of money. I think Jeff did this a bit, but for people, it's kind of like a plug for people in my position, but for sort of you know postdoctoral and early career researchers, because often they are doing you know, really exciting, um, you know, important work, but particularly with the kind of funding um, apparatus as it is now, it's very hard for them to kind of make a step onto the funding ladder. And I think so if there were more opportunities, that, you know, that could then, um, you know, be a bridge for you widening the network of people you work with. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, the only thing I'm not, not really just talking to Chris about is I think the only other thing that's clearly happening um, and I, it's been gradually growing for some for some years now, but it's really hit the fan. I think in the last year or two, or possibly three, is the way in which depart university departments, or indeed university faculties, and therefore universities themselves, are now strategizing about funding um, and triaging and assessing b bids before they go anywhere near the funder. Um, and that might mean your lead-in times are a bit longer, particularly if it's for significant amounts, I mean, by which I mean you know, two, three hundred thousand plus sums of money. So there's an awful lot of politics now that go on within the institutions and indeed within departments, uh, not just uh, between an individual or a, a group of researchers and the, the funder, whoever that funder might be. And that's a really big shift, actually, I think. It, re it really is. wanted to add more, one more point. Um, if the funding bid too is truly participatory, uh, I mean, I know J, um, uh, Joseph Rowntree um, work with users of research in a way that many other funding bodies don't in, in developing ideas, but we've also got to work, work with, with users as, as people carrying out the research. So uh, again, that sort of relationship, especially in early career, if you haven't necessarily built up a very close relationship with um, population of service users and um, you need time to build that in and that, that takes very careful time you can't put you can't you know expect them to act like academics and stay stay awake uh, overnight doing the research um, uh, grant um, so I think you need to think carefully about that that sensitive kind of uh, relationship too No, it was just to say that with, I mean, the, the work that I did with the film was sort of, I guess, could go within the frame of participatory research. And I definitely think that with the more participatory projects, there often is a potential to look beyond some of the more, I guess, traditional university funders. And that's where things like the lottery um, are, I think they're quite often untapped resources um, that people maybe don't think of as potential funders. So.
my experience with that is that it, it really does vary by funder. So the ESRC, I think, is pretty flexible. They like to be kept in the loop. And they like an explanation for why your research might be changing direction. Um, most funders I've dealt with will negotiate on the start time if, some, if there's a genuine reason. So if they've decided that they want to fund this research, then on the whole they will. But there will be obviously be exceptions to that if they have to spend it in a certain time or if it, it's for a, a more of a kind of user organisation and they, they need that research before a certain time, then obviously that will be less flexible. But in terms of how you plan it, um, I would say, yeah, don't, don't worry too much about that. You don't want to be like putting in tons of applications and your institution would probably have concerns if you were doing too many. But I think on the whole, it is so hard these days to get funding that it's, it would be a really unusual situation if they all came off and then I think it would be a nice situation to be dealing with. Um, but you, what you could do, I suppose, and, and what I've done with a couple of times is, is just think about how they would fit together. Like, is there overlap between these different projects, which would mean it would actually be feasible for them to be running alongside each other and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd agree with that. I mean, I have uh, had periods where I've held more than one grant, in fact, three grants. One was a very small one, and it can be quite hellish, and uh, you really have to have a good relationship with your line manager to negotiate uh, workload again, if you're, especially if you've got a big admin role. Um, so um, I'd also say that um, although it's a very competitive world, we really need to be careful about responding with integrity to, to the need for, for um, uh, to be winning grants because uh, some grants you can't do, do quickly. So I think very carefully about if you are putting in a lot uh, about the achievability and, and the aims. Uh, um, I'm working on, I'll give you an example, I'm working on one at the moment that's about the visual death and dying and you can't, you can't rush that one it's got to be taken slowly and it's, I've got to make sure that I've got space if I do win that money to, to carry that out carefully um, <laughs> when you've got a grant in terms of flexibility to respond um, there's no wiring in staff costs so your staff costs are pretty much set but you can wire under other headings so there is room there so I would say uh, if you can see, if, if something crops up, you can see it coming, think carefully about holding back money in one area if you can and asking your, your grant body if you can via cost. The last project I did um, was about um, visual representations of ageing, worked with a group of older women uh, in a, as participatory a fashion as possible, but when it came up to the exhibition, which was the climax of the research, we realised that actually if we um, engaged with the women to to decide on, on the, the exhibition itself, we'd probably need a few more years. So we <laughs> vied a bit of money and, and, and hired in. With everybody's um, uh, acceptance of the idea, we put the idea out to everybody, we hired in a professional curator. So it was a, a short um, pos position, it's a short term position, um, but um, we, we we had to be flexible about that too. So you do need to think, uh, grants always don't, don't always work out how you expect them to and you've got to build in flexibility. Also, if you realise you're coming to the end of a grant and there is a really good bit of impact you could achieve, talk to your funding body because if you can sell it to them and there's enough money left, they usually allow you to extend the project too, but don't leave it till the last minute. Um, and then there are things that occur that you just have to be as flexible as possible. I was just uh, is that a baby in there? <laughs> I see. If your researcher becomes pregnant, you have to think very carefully. You know, and, and uh, 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 the funding bodies still have a lot to learn about um, uh, that this world, uh, this real world that we live in, where people get pregnant and go off and have maternity leave, and they still haven't got their responses to that exactly right. Um, but I think it is open up the dialogue as much as possible. I'm sure um, um, you, you would agree as a funder that if it's about having those sorts of conversations and not leaving it to the panicky last minute. Won't it? Yes, well, uh, we're probably most flexible on the end date, although that drives me nuts. <laughs> um, but except that research is in inherently venturing into the unknown, mm -hmm. so you don't quite know what you're going to get. That's the point of doing it. Um, <coughs> we... You, we're less flexible on the budget, the overall budget, but very flexible within the budget envelope itself. Mm -hmm. So if, if you want to redesign the whole project, as long as it's still within the budget and for a good reason, then that's something that, that we'll look at. 
and we, you know, we would certainly put extra funding in if, if there was an opportunity for impact later down the line. And we look at influencing and communications and dissemination money separately to the main contracts, and we'll try and negotiate and build that in later on when we know more about what we're dealing with. Um, but our funding model now is that money is allocated to each calendar year, and then it has to be contracted within that calendar year. So things get really hairy in December because we said we're spending all this money we haven't contracted yet, but you can still negotiate on the start date, but we can't really negotiate on the contract date. And because, because we do programmatic funding, so many of the projects are dependent on other projects, so mm. that it has knock-on effects if we delay the start of one project on, on the other, so we don't tend to do that unless it's, you know, we don't have any other choice. Well, I think we're, we're 